Hello everybody, it's I, Eternal Flame here, and today we are here to do part 2 of what if Yuji had awoken Shrine early or awoken Shrine against Mahito. And I'm actually really surprised with the amount of positive reception that I got on the first part of the what if, so thank you to everybody who actually liked the what if as much as you guys did. And as you guys can tell, I wasn't expecting to do a part 2 of the what if, but a lot of you guys did want a part 2 of the what if, so we are going to go into part 2 of what would happen if Yuji had awoken Shrine, where we're basically going to go over the entire Shinjuku showdown and how Yuji having shrine early is going to affect the Shinjuku showdown. So for further ado, let's get straight into the story of what if Yuji had awoken shrine early. As Yuji was left just to watch, left to watch helplessly as Sukuna and Urame left, with nowhere near enough curse energy to chase after them or anything of the sort, he was left to watch and feel helpless as he was laughed at by the very monster that had been in his body for so long. Despite the fact that he had awakened Shrine, despite the fact that he was more okay with using Shrine than he ever was before and felt like he was on a better path, he could ultimately do nothing but watch. Watch as one of the few friends he had left were taken away. Taken away by the very monster that had tormented him for so long and had the final laugh in the end, but then Yuji snapped himself out of this feeling of helplessness that he was feeling. After all, this feeling of helplessness that Yuji was feeling was doing nothing but making things worse, and he couldn't just give up that easy. After all, he knew Megami would not give up on him like that, so there's no way he was going to give up on his friend. Sakuna had decided to leave Yuji alive because they believed that Yuji Itadori was of so little value that they could laugh at him while they flew away. Believing Yuji to be of so little importance and so little of a threat that they could just leave him there, that there would be nothing Yuji could do to ever change fate. But now Yuji was determined to make sure they regret that choice, determined to kill Sukuna and he'd do anything to do so. First step though he knew would be mastering Shrine. After all, while he most definitely made progress with Shrine, it wasn't enough. The buff that he had gotten against Sukuna was not enough. He would need to be stronger. He could feel how much of a difference there was between Sukuna and himself, and he knew the next time they fought, he would not be able to rely on Megami to save him like he was able to save him this time. However, here is when we get to the one month time skip as well as the preparation phase for their battle against against Sukuna. However, if you do want to actually skip past the preparation phase for the battle, then you can skip to the time frame on screen, and you'll basically be able to figure out the preparations as we go. If you do not want to skip past them, then just continue on to the rest of the video. Now up first, and this is probably going to be one of the most important things I need to establish, Yuji is still going to have blood manipulation in this timeline. A bunch of people in the first video didn't actually think that Yuji was going to end up having blood manipulation, mainly because he already had shrine this early on. However, right now we have a Yuji who feels even more like he is not enough, mainly because of the fact that he has access to this technique that he had pushed so heavily, and yet even that wasn't enough to take down Sukuna. So this Yuji is probably going to be even more desperate than canon Yuji actually is right now to take out Sakuna, which is absolutely insane considering how desperate canon Yuji actually is to take out Sakuna as well, and this Yuji is probably deeper into that desperation even compared to canon Yuji. So yes, this Yuji does have access to blood manipulation. It's also a little bit debatable that this Yuji might have access to a better version of of blood manipulation in comparison to what his canon counterpart has. This is mainly because of the fact that Yuji already has experience with a curse technique, and as we can tell from both Yuda Akotsu as well as Sukuna, if you have previous experience with a curse technique, it does make it easier to use other curse techniques. Maybe. We don't fully know if that's how it works or doesn't know how that works, but from what we can tell from both of them, that might be how it works. For the sake of this video, I'm not going to apply that, and we're going to say Yuji has the same level of blood manipulation, but it could be possible that Yuji does have access to better levels of blood manipulation. So at best, Yuji's actually able to use Piercing Blood in this timeline. So this does also mean that Yuji is still going to have Simple Domain as well as all the soul stuff that he had studied. However, his RCT is actually going to be better than what it is in canon as well. The main reason why his RCT is going to be better than in canon is because Yuji is going to use Shrine on himself constantly to train Shrine, which by extension will allow him to train his RCT because it will let him get better and better with reattaching limbs because he's healing from much more lethal blows than what he would be healing from normally. So to put the level of this Yuji into perspective, I think this Yuji when it comes to pure rock curse energy refinement and hand-to-hand -hand combat would be stronger than the level he was at when he went to Shinjuku, but I don't think he'd be stronger than current awakened Yuji. However, he more than makes up for that with his new master of cleave and dismantle because he is much better at cleave and dismantle. So he does have much more range attacks that he's much better with because of how practiced he would be with Shrine by this point since he's had this technique for around a month now. Overall, this Yuji is stronger than current Awakened Yuji when factoring in everything he has including his much more master version of Shrine. As our story resumes one week before the battle in Shinjuku happens, one week before the fated day for everyone to challenge Sakuna and Kenjaku. With Yuji and Gojo currently being present inside of a training room with each other, Gojo having brought him in while everyone else was talking about their plans that they needed to keep secret from Yuji. 
As during that time, Gojo properly congratulated Yuji for awakening his technique and the growth he has made in such a short period of time. He had to admit the growth of his students was truly something else, but then he told Yuji the real reason he brought him here. He wanted to have a sparring match with Yuji, and that was what they were going to spend all day doing. The point of a sparring match was quite simple in Gojo's mind. While he believed that there was no chance that Cleave and Dismantle could bypass his barrier, other than maybe in a domain, he wanted to be ready and he wanted to know how Cleave and Dismantle felt so he could prepare prepare for that. And sure, while Yuta Akotsu could potentially do this as well, Yuta Akotsu could only offer that experience for 5 minutes at best, but Yuji on the other hand had been training and mastering this technique for so long now for the entire month time skip. He also knew how Yuji grew best, which was through combat, which was through sparring that he had seen time and time again, whether it was with Toto, whether it was with Hanami, whether it was with Mahito, he knew Yuji grew best through fighting people. However, for obvious reasons, that ended up confusing Yuji. After all, Yuji had no way to bypass that limitless barrier. He could punch, kick, throw a dismantle, cleave, it would never land, which was why Gojo told him he'd deactivate the infinity barrier. As he said, you know, I created this barrier to be untouchable, but with time, people seem to just be finding ways to get past it, so I've been embracing that, and besides, this is just for me. You might be able to pick up something too, and maybe finish what you've been working on. And that was when the two of them began their spar, and at that moment he understood well just how powerful Gojo was. Of course he did know that Gojo was the strongest, he always believed Gojo was the strongest, but actually feeling it, man Gojo was strong. Not just because of his technique, but because of his skill. His amazing amount of skill, when it came to hand to hand, he was on another level, and each time Yuji landed a cleave or dismantle, Gojo could just heal it off or take it. But he could also tell Gojo's punches were unique. After all, ever since he became a sorcerer, he'd been punched by a lot of unique punches, so he got good at recognizing them. He didn't immediately catch on at first, though. It wasn't the first time he got hit, the second, or even the fifth, but he was able to catch on to the fact that Gojo was using his curse technique in his punches, which ended up sparking another idea in Yuji's head, which Gojo could see and that caused Gojo to smile as well. Which led to the two sparring for hours for the entire day, however Gojo ended up winning every single sparring match, every single one, however Yuji could feel that he was getting a bit better, a bit more control over himself, however even with all these there was something that did bother him, he couldn't access the flames that Sakuna could access, and he was questioning why, he made a lot of progress with this technique yet he was never able to feel the same flames that Sakuna had used on Maharaga and Jogo. As Gojo then told him he would help Yuji figure that out after he beat Sakuna. As then we flash forward to the present, with Gojo cut in half and Tsukashimo turned to bits. With both Yuji and Higuruma hopping onto the battlefield as Yuji immediately starts out the battle by launching out a wave of dismantles right at Sakuna. As Sakuna then immediately said good, but not good enough before launching out a slash right at Yuji's multiple waves of slashes, just to send the message that all Sakuna needed was one slash to equal out the massive amount of progress that Yuji had made. However, one of the slashes actually ended up hitting the ground not near Sakuna, while the other slashes were countered by Sakuna and equaled out. But the entire purpose of this wasn't actually to launch it as an attack at Sakuna, but to make a smoke screen, so Yuji could disappear in the smoke and immediately land a punch on Sakuna. However, this punch was blocked, but even with it being blocked, Sakuna felt a vibration in his body. As that vibration did confuse him, but before he could even have enough time to think on that, Yuji immediately pulled what he pulled against Mahito, which was grabbing Sakuna's arm and using cleave that was blocking his punch. Of course that cleave did not do a significant amount of damage to Sakuna at all, but Sakuna did notice that that cleave did a little bit more damage than what he was expecting. Maybe he did underestimate how much Sakuna had grown as a rope wrapped around one of his hands as well, before Higuruma casted a domain expansion with himself, Yuji, and Sakuna present inside the domain. Now here is where we got into a little bit of a crossroads, mainly because of the fact that they can't pull off the same plan that they pulled off in canon, mainly because in this what if Higuruma never actually ended up casting his domain for a second time on Yuji. Which means the Shibuya trial never ends up happening. However, I do think no matter what the trial actually ends up being, that Sakuna is at least going to get confiscation happen to him. The main reason is because Sakuna really wants to see the Executioner's Sword, so he's just going to admit himself as guilty. So I also think that Sakuna would end up calling a retrial if necessary, and that would be what ends up getting the Executioner's Sword. So yeah, we're just going to say Higuruma does end up confiscating Kamutoke while also having the Executioner's Sword. As right after Kusakabe, Ino, and Choso all arrive, with Kusakabe quickly activating Simple Domain in order to move in front of Higuruma and take the slashes so Higuruma himself doesn't get hit. Before Sakuna then goes out of his way to acknowledge the fact that they have all leveled up their fundamentals in Curse Energy Strengthening. 
as well as the fact that Simple Domain was capable of weakening Sakuna's curse technique, though not to the same degree of what Domain Amplification would have done. Before it's then, Sakuna challenges Yuji to a race, as he then immediately goes out of his way to impale Choso with both of his arms, as Ino would immediately go for an attack straight on Sakuna's head, while at the same time Yuji would launch out two dismantles straight at Sakuna's leg. However, Sakuna is still too quick to counter, as he immediately throws out a slash of his own, resulting in that slash countering out Yuji's two slashes and hitting both Kusakabe and Yuji. Before it's then, Sakuna grabs Higuruma and throws him away from the battlefield while also landing a punch straight on his jaw, as he immediately chases after Higuruma, with Yuji chasing after him, as Yuji then tried to launch a dismantle into the ground in order to try and launch himself forward, and while this did end up helping his momentum and speed a little bit, it wasn't enough to catch up to the absolute speed demon that was Sakuna. This results in the first half of Higuruma versus Sakuna going the exact same, with Higuruma eventually awakening domain amplification and Sakuna calling out to Higuruma by his name. As Yuji then tries to make an opening for Higuruma to land a hit by launching out a wave of slashes right at Sakuna, however Sakuna in that moment vanishes away from the slashes, not even entertaining them by sending his own slash back at them, with him catching Yuji's hand and using his other hand to place his hand right on Yuji's gut. Before it's then, Sakuna calls him a boar as he immediately uses Cleave right on his side entirely, destroying his stomach and side while launching him away. Even though Yuji ended up healing himself faster than he did in canon, even though Yuji had a stronger range attack he could launch out being dismantled, it didn't matter. Even though Higuruma could awaken reverse curse technique, it didn't matter. He ultimately ended up dying. And this death, the moment that the Executioner's Blade faded away, hit hard for Yuji. After all, this was the man who had brought him out of the state he was previously in. This was the man who had convinced him that it was okay to use Shrine on people, that Shrine wasn't an evil technique, just it had an evil user in Sukuna. Sukuna, the one who had now taken away Higuruma from him, taken away another person that Yuji had considered a friend. As Yuji then blocks Sukuna's strikes before Sukuna kicked Yuji away, as he then launched two slashes right out at Yuji, however Yuji ended up healing off those slashes. As Sukuna was now stuck in a trance, thinking about how much Yuji had improved, and how much this actually annoyed him. Not just that Yuji had managed to learn reverse curse technique, but he was skilled with it, but he also had managed to improve his curse energy strengthening, and that his shrine had gotten much better as well. Before his thoughts then went to Higuruma, and himself questioning if Higuruma's death disappointed him, as he then reminded himself of his own ideals. Of his own ideals that he lives the way he desires to until the day he dies. If he wants to eat, he will eat. If he sees an eyesore, he'll kill it. And if it entertains him, he will throw it a bone. He lives how he chooses to live, and if people are unable to measure up to that, then you have to blame yourself. So we believe that he shouldn't have been irritated. He shouldn't have been irritated over Higuruma's death, unless over the millennium he had changed. And in that moment, he was able to see who was the crux of all of that. The brat that was currently standing in front of him. Sakuna had fought a countless amount of battles, battles of people who were more experienced than Yuji was, more powerful than Yuji was, and with amazing techniques, and yet none of them affected him in the same way that Yuji did. And that was because none of them possessed the same unbreakable ideal like Yuji did. To him, he could never understand their ideals. To him, it seemed like their ideals were nothing more than dying wishes, and yet he couldn't deny the fact that Yuji had an ideal to kill Sakuna, one that was unbreakable. After all, he had shared a body with Yuji for so long. And he knew better than anybody that every single time you broke Yuji down, his soul would get back up. This unbreakable resolve was something Sakuna could not deny. After all, Yuji had nothing else special about him. The most notable thing Yuji had going for him was the fact that he had access to Sakuna's technique, that he had access to a technique he wasn't even born with. And yet, Yuji was able to rival him on nothing but ideals and wills, which was something that made Sakuna feel deeply unpleasant, something that Sakuna very much did not like, as Sakuna had believed that he had surpassed ideals, that Sakuna was no longer bound by ideals, and yet he could see someone in front of him, someone who directly represented the potential that he could be wrong, holding his very technique itself and being fueled by nothing but ideals. While Sakuna loathed his ideals, loathed those ideals that made him human, Yuji was standing on those ideals. Right now they were two opposites of the same coin, so that was what caused Sakuna to make his decision. That he was going to break Yuji's will, break Yuji's ideals to bits. Something he would never do for someone normally, but Yuji was the exception for those unbreakable ideals. Before it was then, a new rule was added to the calling games, one that gave Sukuna the full authority to start the merger, as Sukuna consumed Tengen. 
and it is then right after Yuta, Kotsu, and Rika hop into the battlefield, with Yuta, Kotsu activating his domain expansion and the battle going the exact same until Yuji Itadori joins in the battle inside of Yuta, Kotsu's domain expansion. With Yuji starting the fight by landing two punches right on Sakuna's arm, however Yuji is quick enough to land a third punch, but this third punch is a little bit more unique, because this time he'd actually tried to engulf his hands in Dismantle which ended up making the punch do even more damage to Sakuna in comparison to before. However, it didn't actually lower Sakuna's output, as this was something Yuji was trying to do since the beginning of this fight, if not even before this. This was the idea that Yuji had gotten when he was sparring with Gojo and saw Gojo's blue fists, and it was proven to be fully possible when he saw the way that Yuta Akotsu's slash was blocked by Sakuna, which was by Sakuna covering his hands in little slashes. So instead, Yuji was going to try and integrate this into his hand-to-hand -hand style. And now that his body had directly felt it, he just needed to make sure he could land enough hits with this new technique, just to make sure it became second nature to him. As Rika then tried to slam her fist right down on Sakuna, but Sakuna ended up dodging. However, even though Sakuna ended up dodging, he got hit by Yuta Akotsu's technique, resulting in Shikigami slashing at his back. And in that moment, they were really able to feel just how much damage Gojo had left behind on Sakuna. After all, thanks to his fight against Gojo, he was unable to expand his domain expansion. The effects of his reverse curse settings had remained sluggish, and at this point, his total amount of curse energy matched that of Yuta Akotsu. Furthermore, Sakuna also needed to maintain using Hollow Wicker Basket, which rendered him completely unable to use the world bisecting Dismantle. However, even more than that, Yuji with every single one of his punches was able to weaken Sakuna's curse energy output as well as weaken the harmony between his soul and Megami's soul. As that was when Rika threw Yuji at Sakuna, as Yuji clinged onto Sakuna's arm. But this time Yuji actually had something special in mind. As Yuta Akotsu had used curse speech to tell Sakuna to not move, Yuji had activated Cleave right on Sakuna's arm. However, this time, the cleave had a very different effect in comparison to normal, because not just was the cleave damaging, this cleave also ended up weakening Sakuna's output, which this ended up catching Sakuna completely off guard, mainly because of the fact that Yuji had used cleave in the battle beforehand, but he had chosen not to actually attack his arm, but that was when Sakuna had a memory. Back when Mahito tried to use Idle Transfiguration on Yuji for the second time, and then Sakuna landed a slash on Mahito, as Sakuna realized right in that moment that that gave away that it was possible for his slashes to land a hit on the soul. And since Yuji was already using the same logic that he had used against Mahito to hit Mahito's soul in order to shake Sakuna's soul, it was only natural Yuji would figure out a way to make it apply to Shrine as well, when Sakuna had already displayed it was possible for Shrine to do that. Before, Yuta Akotsu had used Fin Ice Breaker to launch Sakuna back, leading to Rika comboing with that by slamming Sakuna into the ground as both Yuji and Yuta rushed at Sakuna. And while Sakuna did launch out a wave of dismantles at both Yuji and Yuta, it ended up launching them back, but not as much in comparison to before. The wounds were not as deep in comparison to before as well as the wounds were very quickly healing on the both of them, with Sakuna questioning what they had been up to for the past month. As this was when Yuji and Rika decided to begin to lay pressure into Sakuna, with Yuji going for two dismantle amped punches straight on Sakuna's arms, while at the same time Rika had gone for a punch straight on his other arm. Before Yuta Akotsu using Clairvoyance was able to predict the future on Sakuna, and it allowed him to land his own cleave right on Sakuna. However, this cleave was actually Yuji's usage of cleave and not Sakuna's usage of cleave. The reason why it's Yuji's usage of cleave and not Sakuna's usage of cleave that Yuta copied is because of the fact that he, they don't have to risk Rika eating a Sakuna finger and risk what could potentially come with that. Of course we know in canon that there would be no risk mainly because Rika is not a person so Sakuna cannot manifest inside of Rika since Rika is kind of like is a weird territory of curse in Shikigami but basically there's not enough of a soul for Sakuna to manifest inside of Rika. It's better to not have to take that risk so they just copy it from Yuji instead. This also does allow them to keep the secret that they actually have Sakuna's other finger, rather than Sakuna knowing about the fact that they have that finger. As it was then Yuji and Yuta began to bombard Sakuna with attacks. Yuji going for a punch straight on Sakuna's jaw, while at the same time Yuta Akotsu ended up going for a strike straight on the stomach. The two's moves were in near perfect sync, which wasn't a surprise considering how well Yuji was when it came to fighting with people, as Yuji kneed Sakuna straight in the face while also grabbing onto his head, but immediately after performing that move, he ended up using Cleave on Sakuna's head through both his hand as well as his knee. The Cleave wasn't strong enough to go through Sakuna's head, however it was strong enough to shake up Sakuna's soul and weaken Sakuna's output even more. Stack that with the hits that Yuji had already been landing, and Sakuna's output was in quite a bad place at that current moment. However, Sakuna then went immediately for cleaving Yuji's entire chest, but Yuji ended up spitting up some blood in Sakuna's eye. Before Yuji then healed himself and coated his leg in dismantle in order for him to land a kick on Sakuna. 
as the slashes were launched out from his leg, even though Sakuna had blocked the strike, resulting in the Sakuna being launched even further back and even harder straight into Rika's punch. However, unknowingly to Yuji, he had tipped his hand to how his abilities worked to Sakuna. Before it was then, Sakuna released Hollow Wicker Basket as Rika and Yuji both went for holding down Sakuna's arms, while Yuta at the same time took Sakuna's tongue straight out. And while Sakuna did try and launch out a wave of slashes at Yuta in order to launch him away, his slashes were weakened to such a point he was barely knocked back. However, this was when Yuji decided to show off that he had blood manipulation via using the blood he had made earlier in order to blind Sakuna, allowing Yuta to cut off the other hand. And then after that, Rika held Sakuna down as Yuji went for a punch on Sakuna's gut. This made to be a soul-infused punch with even more curse energy in comparison to normal in order to wake up after all the level of control that Sakuna had on the soul was much more in the gutters. Yuji had completely undone the process of the bath by this point and how suppressed Megami's soul actually was at least temporarily. However, in spite of all of that, in spite of all the effort that both Yuji and Yuta had put in and how much more they had drastically weakened Sakuna's soul and weakened the level of control he had, it was still not enough. Not because of the strength of Sakuna's soul, but because of one thing they could not plan for, because of one thing they could never plan for, which was how broken Megami truly was by this point. Before Yuta Akotsu was then cut in half, followed by a stab from Maki's soul-split katana right into Sakuna's chest. And that is where we're going to end this part. I'm going to be honest with you guys, I was not expecting this episode to be that long. Like, I genuinely thought we were going to get through Shinjuku Showdown in less than 20 minutes, and man, we really did not. We are only past the Yuta Akotsu part of this fight. Our thank you to everyone who watched the full video, and thank you for all your support for this what if. I'm gonna dip and see y'all later. Have a good day. Peace out.